Good evening, everyone, and welcome to week two of our coaching webinars here on Fermanagh GA TV. We had a great reaction to last week's presentation from uh, Stephen Poacher. And this week, we're absolutely delighted to welcome another top coach, this time from our own county, a man from Listen Ski Emmets, none other than Owen Mooney. And Owen is the, currently a full-time coach with uh, Dublin GA. Owen, you are very, very welcome to Fermanagh GA TV. Good to, good to have you on board. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, good man. Great to see you. Uh, all, you're keeping well? Keeping well as well as can be expected in the difficult times that we're in, but in and kind of same as everybody else, just getting on with it and trying to make the best of the situation that we have. Yeah, and I suppose it's, uh, the listeners will, and viewers will be interested as to how uh, a coach operates at, at, at this time uh, in your, your role as a Dublin GA coach. How are you uh, working through this uh, time? So we have a work schedule for all the GPOs and the RDOs and within Dublin. So we've been kept busy in relation to the coaching department because of obviously we can do everything over Microsoft Teams and over Zoom here like this. But um, Dublin GA have over the last three years been doing award one courses, um, the theory elements through webinars anyway. So it's helped me in terms of my role, in terms of keeping things busy for ourselves and staying visible in within the coaching department, as well as kind of helping coaches in terms of coach support. Um, anything that our GPOs are doing and the Dublin GA skills initiatives that they're currently doing with their club and obviously within in the Dublin area, which is great. Myself, obviously, I only started the role um, three weeks yeah. before lockdown, um, yeah. before the restrictions came in. So. Um, a little bit difficult in that sense in terms of just getting to know the staff um, in, in the department and obviously within Dublin G as a whole. So uh, looking forward to obviously getting back to part of the park at some stage, um, but I will be working from home anyway. Um, and that was the plan, but obviously this has been accentuated because of this. Uh, oh, and you, you mentioned the staff there. I suppose we're familiar with the, the staff and from our GA, you know, Teresa McNabb and uh, uh, Owen and uh, Sean and a couple of other guys that are out, out in the schools and you know maybe five or six but by the sounds of things there's a whole lot more uh, in Dublin. Can, can you give us a, a bit of background as to how many people are actually involved in coaching in GEA? Yeah in so Dublin? obviously is there um, people be aware or maybe not be aware that um, a lot of the Dublin clubs have a games motion officer so basically they are the games development officer within that club so they'd be um have maybe the link with the schools they go into the schools to do coaching within their cluster schools they'd also um assist in coach education if they're a coach developer themselves um put game development plans in place assist the coaches in the club engage with parents put on different workshops just basically increase participation within the club um and those a lot of those full-time gpos are paid by dublin ga as well as the club so roughly 50, yeah there's, there's an arrangement there i think that's half and half is that right and, roughly 50 and 50. It, yeah and, and has every club a, a, a gpo no not every club um it depends on see, the size of the club depends on the structures within the club um it depends on whether it's viable and what capacity the club has, what support they can get, and obviously um, making sure that the GPO would have work to do. Some of the some GPOs are shared between some clubs. Um, yeah. There's also coach assistance. So some members would go in and coach in the schools, but they're technically not a GA GPO, so they're a part-time volunteer. They're similar to what some clubs would do around Ireland that have a volunteer schools two or three lunch times or two or three days a week yeah it's uh right right so so it's a, it's a there's a big there's a big uh, number of, of of staff involved in it yeah yeah so the each um, dublin is split into three regions um north south and west and there is a regional development officer for those regions who looks after those regions the clubs and then the gpos within um, those regions are basically their games their games managers 
So they are, um, yeah. and it's a different it's a different structure with Dublin just because of the size and the vastness of it and the amount of people involved in the whole process. Um, it takes a lot of work, um, but there's a lot of good support structures within Dublin GA to support the staff, to support the clubs, and to support the volunteers in general. Very good. And before we get into your presentation, because that's uh, evidently what people have tuned in to listen to and watch tonight, um, tell me about how you got involved yourself in, in, in coaching. Are you broke up with it there, Joe? Yeah, no, I was just saying uh, a lot of people tuned in tonight to, to watch your presentation. But uh, before maybe we go into that, how did you get involved yourself in, in the world of coaching? Um, good question. <laughs> I done my first coaching badge when I was 15 um, with the Irish Football Association Mini Soccer Leaders Award. So since then I've been had a had a, a passion for coaching and I always did. Um, I enjoy playing obviously and but I have a fascination for coaching. Very fortunate then obviously doing my coaching badges and you know helping out with Lissus Emmett and helping out the club. Um, got a role with Ulster GA, um, obviously along with Sai Teresa as a Department of Education coach and was very fortunate to be based in my own county. Um, St Ronan's and yeah. Mrs Gay was one of my own schools. Um, so it was, Brilliant. It, was, it was great and was with Ulster GA for roughly 10 years. Um, yeah. Got seconded to Ulster Ladies as Provincial Development Officer. Um, back to my original role with Ulster GA and then I got a role with Rockland GA um, yeah. in New York. But all the experiences that I had with um, Ulster GA, with Fermanagh GA, within the schools, but especially with Lissons Ski Emmets, um, kind of gave me a motivation and a, a passion for coaching because of the people involved in the club and in the county. And I've hopefully taken some of those, um, some of those characteristics and some of those skills. I was forced to be with Arsenal of Ireland and now with Dublin GA. So I um, had a little bit of a nomadic career, uh, in fairness, <laughs> and I've been all over the place, but I'm trying to be settled now. Yeah. Plenty, plenty, yeah. plenty of life experiences, Owen. Hopefully, yeah. It's, yeah. And it's, 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 still, it's still continuing as well. I'm involved with a couple of teams down here as well, Good. coaching and helping out. So. Good. Well, look, at, we're all really looking forward to your presentation and seminar here tonight so uh, rather than listening to us two chatting maybe it's time to hand over to yourself here Owen now uh, for your uh, presentation I'm sure we'll look at we'll hook up after that and we'll have a bit of a chat about it. No problem Joe. Good man thank, thank you. Okay guys um, obviously uh, as Jerry said some of you have been looking forward to this presentation um, I don't know whether that's true or not <laughs> Hopefully um, it will be at the end. So my subject tonight is on coaching children, behaviours, environments, knowledge and understanding. Now, how I'm going to do it is I'm going to go through the who, what, um, why and how questions. And you'll see kind of how I'm going about it in the presentation later on. But there's a little bit of a background to why I'm doing this. Obviously, we've spoke there now about um, my coaching background and my coaching experiences and when I started with Ulster I was always involved with youth players so players from 13 to 18 and obviously playing myself adult football but when I got the role with Ulster GA and working with children in primary schools from P1 4 to 8 years of age it was just a complete mesmerizing experience really enjoyable good fun and um, gave me a a passion, an even bigger passion for coaching. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but also some of the things that I've learned across my journey and some of the research that I'm doing at the minute for my PhD. So we will... Okay, so first slide here is um, kind of just to put you in the mindset of when you're coaching children, you're building blocks. So. Children love building blocks and they always start at the bottom and they work their way right up to the top as in like a pyramid like you see on screen. Um, but you as a coach um, are going to continue to add to those blocks during every session so that there's a learning outcome for every session. And it doesn't have to be 30 or 40 learning outcomes. One, one is enough. One theme, one concept, one skill, 
um, because you want to make your job easier and more enjoyable for yourself. So the simpler you keep it, um, the more manageable you keep it, you'll enjoy it more. And with any luck, the children will get a lot more out of it. Um, so as I said, I'm going to look at four questions here. Now, the where and when is obviously the where is where you're going to do your session and what time. So I'm not really going to worry too much about those questions. But I'm going to um, mesh into the behaviours, environment, knowledge and understanding um, for all these questions and why you're doing it and what you're doing and how you're doing it. And it's related to my research now with coaching children through play. But there's only going to be part of this presentation about play. It's about coaching children, how you can give them a meaningful experience, create an environment that they're going to continue to come back to your sessions, be involved in the club, not only as a player, but then later on when they're involved in the club as um, being involved with the committee or helping out or anything, anything that you want to keep them involved as much as you can and creating that environment when they're young is the best way to do it. So the who first is obviously um, this presentation is about coaches and children. Um, now, what I want to talk about here is the voice of the child. So my research is on the voice of the child, is getting their experiences and what play means to them, but generally what um, sport or what their club means to them or what their friends mean, but I, as well as what their coach means to them. You know, how big an influence the coach plays. And the coach is a huge responsibility because if you get to know the children and create a connection with them, you'll find out what obviously their home life is like, what's happening in schools. You care about them. You care about the child. You're not, you're not overcompensating about having to catch and kick. No, that'll come. But creating an environment that children are going to learn that you're going to make those connections, excuse me, that you're going to make those connections, that it's about them and it's not about you as a coach. Um, but then your perspective is you want them to learn. You want them to learn the skills, have competency. You want them then to improve their skills. And as they work their way up through the age groups, um, they're going to have to obviously learn new skills to go along. But rather than tell them the skills, you want to involve them um, in the process. So questioning over telling, involving the children over telling them what to do. So involve them in their learning. Um, and that's probably the most difficult aspect that I've found in terms of my research, but also in terms of me, is questioning children, but through pragmatic language that the children can understand um, before you even kind of um, create a new concept for them, for them to learn. So there's a little bit of kind of give and take and a little bit of teamwork here, but Asking the children what they enjoy is the easiest way to do that. So obviously, it's all about the child. Um, it's all about the person. And you see here is the relationships I'm going to talk about on the right hand side. Um, and yes, it's child and coach, but the parents are so important. Engaging with the parents is vital. When I was in Rockland GA, um, I was over the under six program, so from three years of age to six years of age, and I was specifically over that program, and I had to put a presentation together for the club because they didn't want me over the program. They didn't want me with a specific age group, but there was a method of my madness. It was not for the children. It was not for coaching them. It was to engage with the parents at that entry level. So I will create connection with the parents. I'll get to know the parents. I'll obviously get to know the children more when they move up through the age groups, through the age groups. But the parents were vital because they were then going to be future coaches or they were going to help out in the club at events or they were going to help out at music sessions or being involved in the club. And once we had them, then it was seamless and it was so enjoyable. Um, and then obviously you want them to stay within the club. You want them to enjoy being involved in the club and obviously with the GEA, it's a community organization. So after the sessions and whenever they are finished with your session specifically, you want to be good people and you want to create uh, an environment that allows that to happen so that they're making mistakes. 
they are participating, they're showing teamwork. They have trust with you, but also with their teammates and with the club. So that when they are wearing Listen's Gamut's gear or Rockland GA gear or Garrison, Devonish gear um, or Tempo, that whenever they're outside the club and they're wearing that gear, people see them wearing that gear. So they are showing that the club is a good club. The children are well behaved. The people are well behaved within that club. And that's so important because you only have them for a little while, two sessions maybe, max maybe two, two and a half hours. But what happens then when they go home? How are they being, how are they um, interacting with the community? And that's so important because then you're hopefully going to get more people involved in the club when they see that. So the second part on the left hand side now is uh, playful learning asking you. So basically for the children, or sorry, purposeful learning asking you. So my research is on play, but there's a lot of obviously research in terms of free play and play is there's no real learning in play, but there is, and it's a lot of it has to do with context. So obviously in terms of now the situation that we're in, parents are obviously um, the children are out the back playing and my next door neighbours here beside me, it's a house of four boys ranging from 13 down to four and there is a lot of play. They're out the back, they're on the trampoline, there is risky play, there is rough and tumble play, there is dramatic play, but they're engaging with each other and they're learning. Um, be related to a skill or related to attacking or defending. Um, and that's how you can make it purposeful. But make sure that you ask the children, what are they learning? Um, what are they doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And again, there's different kind of questions that you can ask and we'll go over that a little bit later on. But what you don't want is to prepare uh, the path for the child. You want to prepare the child for the path. So give the child skills and give them um, chat for the guiding them towards that learning outcome um, and that's where the collaborative nature of the coach and the child come in so involve them in their session um, and then at the bottom is in a mutual trust respect support etc that you can see on the screen and that's your environment and your behaviors as a coach but also the children because children um, a lot of the stuff in terms of asking them questions and involving them in the sessions and making them come up with their own games um, is dependent on the behavior of the children and the behavior of the children with their friends because I know what I was like as a child. And so that's always in the back of my head because I was a little bit mischievous and I like to have fun and a laugh. I was always listening and I enjoyed practice. But if I was, for example, with Teresa McNabb, myself and Teresa would be, you know, we would be messing about when we'd be, you know, maybe the coach may think we wouldn't be listening, but we are. But how do how do you um, kind of counteract that as a coach? Do you separate them or do you challenge those two players more to become little leaders, to become mini coaches, to help out their team? So there's a couple of different kind of resources that you can use for that. But again, get to know your players and the children involved in the sessions and the parents is the easiest way to do that, to create that environment and those behaviours. Um, this one obviously is still with the way, and so now we're moving on to um, just realising that there is a purpose for every part of your session, but that you're not treating them like any adults or children. And obviously the top end and learning and child development is not a linear process. So the coach who has a mini adult plan will give the give the children an A, and then they want to, the coach wants them then to move on to the next stages, which is B. But to get to B, the children might have to take three steps back to go one step forward. So that's where the reality kicks in. So challenging the children that's related to them, and that is not too hard, not too easy that the challenge is purposeful and it's within their own learning. Um, so that's very difficult as a coach. And all that is is trial and error. 
and not being afraid to try it, but have patience in the process. So if a session, if you plan a session, plan it great, but nine times out of the whole way session without changing it, you're babysitting, you're not coaching, you're telling, because that's a first stage of moving A, B, C, D, E, the linear process. Different things are going to happen in the environment. It may be raining, it may be cold. Um, little Owen might have had a bad day at school, so he's in bad form, real bad form, and that's upsetting your session. So, you know, you, that's why getting to know the children is extremely important, but having patience for that and being aware of that and not taking it too seriously. So, you know, there's loads of other sessions later on down the line or, you know, giving them practices that they can do at home. And obviously in terms of the situation that we're in, that's happening a lot within schools, but also within clubs. You know, children are practicing their skills and they're playing outside um, and it's gone back to that now. But it's how do you bring that back into when you're going back to practice? So do you still ask the children? Um, do you still do one thing at a time? Because you want them, you want them to learn and want them to succeed as well. So just moving on now to child development. And now this here is, yes, it's research, but in terms of your session, every person who is listening into this is doing all of these child development um, themes in every single session, guaranteed. Um, how much you're doing is dependent on what, what you're doing within your session. But probably the most one that coaches kind of might forget about is the social and emotional. So again, creating an environment, getting to know your children, asking them how they're feeling, asking them what they did at school, um, asking them if they're enjoying their session. You know, that's creating a connection for them. So you're creating that element of, it's socially interactive for them. They're getting to know you better. Um, obviously in terms of speech and language, you might be teaching them a new skill or a new concept or a new new word um, that before and that happened a lot in America was relation to a hand pile a little bit. Fun kick they a lot of them knew it because the American football. But how to in terms of kicking an American football to a, a round ball was a little bit different. The physical skills, so fine and motor uh, gross motor skills. Obviously, most of Gaelic football, hurling, camogie, ladies football, handball and rounders, all the Gaelic games are obviously gross motor skill development. Um, but obviously there is, you can still do the fine motor skill development in terms of small objects, like in terms of pencils and pens, etc. when they're doing it in school. But just being aware of that, because especially if you're working with children who are a lot younger, their fine and gross motor skills won't be as developed as older children. And again, having patience for that. And then obviously the cognitive, you want them to enjoy their sessions. You know, when you want them to be learning something new, that's where one thing at a time comes in. So that the child is developing holistically, like you see here. And it's just being aware of how you're bringing each of them in um, and how much you're bringing in. It doesn't have to be all the time. It doesn't have to be a lot. Just being aware of them is the biggest thing. And this here is just a little bit more detail. So again, it's talked about physical, social, emotional. The sensory is a big one, especially for um, Special Olympics um, as a national coaching sport development coordinator. So the senses would have been very prominent in terms of how we would have coached within Special Olympics and, what, and how you would have coached within the clubs. So sight, touch, smell, hear, and taste, vestibular, and um, proprioception, um, sensory needs was huge. But being aware of that, obviously, with um, any child and any person that you're coaching, um, for example, cold or rain, or you know how, how they are interacting with the environment around them. And then, obviously, the last one, the bottom there that you see, communication. So your passion for coaching, um, how you interact with the children, your facial expressions, your tone of voice is so important. You know, so, and again, the last one, their pragmatic language. So language that they can understand. So instead of talking about social and emotional, you're talking about confidence. You know, how confident are you? Um, so again, it's just making the language suitable to their needs. But there's a kind of a continuum, as I talked earlier on, in terms of coaches and children and bringing them across in terms of their own learning. So 
in terms of education and play, there's a lot on play, education, play-based learning. But in terms of play and sport, there's a bit of a gap in the knowledge. And what I'm looking to do in what I've kind of, there's a draft continuum that I have. And you'll see at the top there, independent thinking and doing is child-led and it's discovery. Them showing them what they can do. Terence McWilliams and Theresa know as well as some of the in-service that we would have done with Ulster GA. A big one was show me. You hear, Jer, Jer Tracy, here's a ball. Show me what you can do with the ball, Jer. So as long as Jer is safe and as long as he is not hurting himself, then he can discover as many different things as he can. It's child-led, but it's facilitated by the coach. Um, then you move on to collaborative. So again, Jer is uh, kind of using his hands all the time. Then I'll go, okay, Jer, can you use your hands and feet together? So then he tries it out. The child and coach together, and that's where um, the zone of proximal development, they call it. And it's um, a play theory from Lev Vygotsky um, during the 1970s about the proximal, the best zone for learning. And that's where coach and child are working together, are scaffolding the learning, are starting out at the foundation stage, like you've seen at the first slide, and they're just building the blocks up as they go along. Right? And if it's too hard, then they'll just come back a step. And that's where the child and coach together um, works very well. And then obviously then in terms of the last one, guided thinking and doing, this is where it's more purposeful. So it's more coach led, but the child is involved in the process. So the coach maybe wants to look at width in their play for under 12s. And they'll be playing a game, but the, the game will be really wide. Now, they still might be very narrow in terms of the game. So that's fine. Then just say, oh, oh, stop the play. Oh, Theresa McNabb, really, really, really wide, keeping the width. How is that going to help us as a team? There is purposeful, guided thinking and doing by questioning and letting the game be the teacher. And that's what you want. But you as a coach have to facilitate that learning and add in little conditions, take out little conditions. But one thing at a time. And again, depending on your theme or concept, that'll, di that'll dictate how purposeful your sessions are and how you question the children. So now, how you do all this? So we talked about the who and the why. Now it's how. So um, some people have been... ...and kind of stuff that I've learned by being involved with Rockland GA as well as Ulster with Lissus Kiamets and with Informana GA as a whole. And it's just a little template that I kind of, I like to use. So fun, enjoyment, creativity. Yes, I want the children to do that, but I would, I would be, class myself as creative, and I, but some of it is about not being afraid to try something. So I'll try it just to see what happens. And I'll reflect on it then. Um, I want to enjoy the sessions myself. Um, and again, I kind of use the, use the children as the guinea pigs and use the players as the guinea pigs. Um, if they're enjoying it, great. But if they're enjoying it, it's going to make me enjoy it a lot more. Um, and obviously, it has to be fun. But their learning is fun. It has to be learning within that. So not just fun for the sake of being fun and laughing and joking. No, it has to be learning involved. Um, relating to the child, and again, Relating to the player, relating to the person, so getting to know them again. Um, understand their needs, understand what they want, um, and questioning them versus telling. Now, there might be sometimes you'll have to tell them, um, depending on their behavior or depending on their cognitive ability. But again, you can still question them. You can still challenge them um, for their own learning because it'll be more beneficial to them rather than you just telling them. They'll understand it a lot better. And embrace the chaos. Uh, every one of my sessions and this presentation is a little bit like organized chaos. Uh, OCD kicks in a lot and I love order and I like structure, but when I'm coaching, it is complete organized chaos and the game is organized chaos. So you as a coach, embracing that chaos is going to be so beneficial for your players because once they cross that white line in a game, you really have a little bit of influence, but not as much as you do. 
what you're going to talk a little bit earlier is keep it simple, keep it short and simple. One thing at a time. Every session, one concept, one skill, or one theme. So if it's hand passing with six year olds, you probably won't start out at hand passing. You start out at show me. Some of them might be able to do it, some of them might be able to hold the ball. So are you going to do hand passing or are you going to bring it back to just catching and pick up and set down? So again, getting to know your players and keeping it simple, short and simple is going to help you along that journey as well. Show me and have a go when you will know are two of the biggest things that I have got from being involved with Ulster GA and Terence McWilliams as well as Trees and my colleagues that I worked with. Embrace my chaos. So have a go at something. Children will, name, sometimes they'll say, I can't do that. I, I, I don't know how to do that. Well, have a go at it. See how it feels. See what you think. You're giving them that understanding that if they make a mistake, that's fine. Are they going to learn from it? That's where your coaching comes in. Um, and understanding that's going to bring in a little bit of creativity. And that's what you want to. Um, but if you do one thing at a time, it's going to make all these things easier rather than worrying about six or seven different things during a session. One thing at a time makes it more manageable for you as a coach and it's going to be more enjoyed. Again, looking at the higher, these are uh, the magic principles. Um, so, players, so being varied and fun, and things are kept new and fresh. Um, so, that's going to increase the motivation of the children, but also you as well. Age appropriate, so obviously, uh, depending on what skill you're doing or depending on what uh, theme or concept within the game, whether it's attacking or defending. You know, make it relevant and age appropriate for the, play, the players in your care. So developmental level of the child is so important. Attacking and defending is so easy to do with children. If I have a ball and I'm playing against Jet, I have the ball. So, okay, who is the attacker here? Some of them might go Jet. Oh, okay. Hmm. So do you think Jet's going to score without the ball? And some of them might say, yeah, if he gets the ball off of one. Oh. So you're asking them a question, but their answers are within the developmental level of themselves. So <laughs> the questions are extremely important in terms of age appropriate activities and games. You don't want to make it too easy or too hard. You know, you want them to enjoy it and to learn throughout the process. Individualized, this is extremely difficult. Um, so differentiation for different abilities, inclusiveness and again this is where the chaos can come in because some children will find it too difficult some will find it too easy some will find it just right that's extremely difficult and the more help you have in that engaging the parents your coaching team if you have them but using some of the children as many coaches as helpers and um, some, some players who are already there giving them a little bit extra responsibility but that everything is child-centered. So that all children, and they get a, uh, an experience of different playing positions, but also that they are made aware of what it's like to be a mini referee, and what it's like to be a mini coach. Well, that's extremely important. So if you have a group of three playing handball or playing 1v1, trying to get past your opponent, that third player, if they're a mini coach, they can look out for one thing that the player with the ball is doing well. If they're a referee, they're the one who decides if the player gets a score or not. So that experience is going to be vital in terms of respect going forward. Again, how through the family games, and again, these here, I'm not going to go through these, give game examples. Um, very difficult doing that here, but one of the things that is going to make it much easier for you is coaching through a game. Now, different activities and are going to be more susceptible to be a game. So scoring a goal, 2v2, etc. But if I'm playing against Jer and he's doing the same activity as me, but he's doing it beside me, we're hitting a target, that's a game. How many can I get before Jer? Right? How many can I get in 30 seconds? That's a target. So that there in terms of games, the family games, it's asking the players sometimes as well, what, what games do they know? Put them in a group of four, 
see what they come up with. And then you can relate it to whatever theme you want to do. Right, guys, group of four, first game, I don't care what you do, but you have to be passing and catching. You might see throwing, you might see kicking, you might see non-passing. Again, then you can narrow the focus then depending on what you want to focus on as a coach. Last couple of slides, guys. So uh, in terms of play, so play is about engaging the children within their session. So it doesn't have to be actually physical play. Social dramatic play, for example, or social play is asking them a question. So that is play. So make time for that. Um, get involved with it yourself. So um, engage with the players, engage with the children, um, whether it's object play or locomotive play, for example. One of the things I would have done when it was The Ulster GAs do things completely wrong, completely wrong. Solo the ball, but the ball hits the roof or it goes up in the sky and I catch it. And all the children laugh at me. And I go, well, that's how I solo when I'm playing for this game. Are you saying that's wrong? And they go, yeah. I go, okay, smarty pants. You tell me how to do it. You show me how to do it. And then I'm thinking, all right, no, this is first learning. It's only able to solo the ball really well. Owen needs a little bit extra help. Teresa is flying. I could use her as a, as a leader. So then you're getting to know your players. You're getting involved. They're engaging their learning. Make space for, you know, make sure that the players are safe, um, that they are able to uh, engage and play within the surroundings and the environment that they're involved with. Last couple. So in terms of what the physical literacy element is throughout. So looking back at the um, building blocks. So A, B, C, S, R, T, C, P, K S. That's how you're going to build it up through the sessions, but you're going to do it constant. So in terms of physical competence, you want that, but you want them to understand why they're doing it. So ask them the question, increase their motivation and increase their confidence in their movement skills and in the skills that they're doing and doing it through activities and games, but engaging the parent as well. And this is how, what you're going to do. Now, this is under four to under 18, and it's a guide of what might what you might do during a session. But you'll only pick one of these per session. So if it's agility, you can do that during the warm up and during your main part of your session, you might be looking at handling. Depending on the age of the group, depending on the um, behavior of the group, the knowledge, again, that's gonna make it, you can make it easier or harder as you go along. But these here things will happen during your session. They'll come up by accident. They'll come up during the games and if it's related to your session, hone in on it. If it's not, let it go, unless it's a safety issue, of course. Right? But again, one thing at a time, keep it short and simple. But again, it always comes back to the who and why. So the who is the children, but it's also you. So collaborating with other coaches, coming on the webinars like this, um, you yeah. have my email address down the bottom. So. <clears throat> more than happy to send um send the resources for example the magic principles and going into more in depth in terms of that player development but you're an inspiration you're an inspiration within your club within the people who are within your coaching team but especially the children and the players if they're coming back to your session it's because they enjoy it but also they might be coming back for you because you include them you have respect for them they have trust of you as well so just before we finish, guys, what I would ask you to do is have a go. Have a go at a new concept or a new theme, at a new game. Try it out. If it falls around you and you're thinking that is absolute rubbish, so what? Reflect on it. Right? At the very bottom there, you see, we learn best when problems and questions come before solutions and answers. And that was on one of the slides of my PhD in the first day and it just resonated with me questioning having problems but how are we going to overcome these problems right how are we going to create a solution so that's where the learning comes in uh, and children are like man and positive and negative as well so how you carry yourself as a coach you're an orchestrator you understand their needs but creating the right balance as well, and that really is very important. Um, I know we're going to kind of touch on this a little bit more in terms of, of 
Play Pirates, guys. Have a go. Enjoy it. And create a huge, brilliant environment for the children. And because you're going to enjoy it. And it's going to be a wonderful experience for yourself. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to Jer's questions and our little chat now. Just 55 seconds over 30 minutes. Excellent, excellent. I love that. I love that last line there. Children are, are like uh, wet cement, whatever falls on them makes an impression. Brilliant. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people will take take that away if not if nothing else. But look at Owen, uh, evidently very, very interesting. And, uh, a lot of research has gone into your your presentation, I, I, I can tell. So, a uh, number of things that I picked up myself have done a fair bit of work here in, in my uh, home club here in Ironbera in Tyrone with the uh, under eights over the last number of years, spent maybe, oh, maybe they got to 10 years involved with them, so great, great, great uh, evenings, Wednesday evenings and Saturday mornings were, were always a joyous uh, event with the under eight boys in, in, in Barra, but uh, I'll bring you back to something you said at the start about um, engagement with parents, and I fully agree with you and how important that is uh, and because you weave them in you bring them into the into the club and get them involved and they get an interest in their um their kids and the kids development and they get to know the coaches and all that's really really important but i'm just interested in how how did you succeed in, in achieving that and getting is there any uh, magic tips in terms of uh, getting those the, the parents so, into that web i suppose if I'm asking. That, that's a really good way of It, you know, taking them into your web and then sticking to them. <laughs> That's probably uh, the work that uh, parents as much as we can. And the Gaelic Start resource that we were all involved with in terms of coming up with the games and um, sessions together and help who's involved in the club at that foundation age was huge. So some of it was done through workshops, through engagement workshops. Some of it was done through the school, through notice boards within the school in terms of, obviously that school club link was hugely important and hugely influential in terms of getting the session. Um, some social media stuff that the clubs have been really good with, but the best one was actually engaging the parents during the sessions because I go on to Rockland a little bit, but in terms of listen ski, for example, um, and one of the things that uh, we would have saw when we were piloting it in Fermanagh, so um, obviously Teresa at the time, she was up in Derry G and they were doing very similar. So we piloted the Gaelic Star program in our own clubs. So one of the stipulations that I had in my own club, and this is key, and is that the parents had to stay at under six and under eight. They had to stay. Now, they didn't have to be a coach. However, I was a floater. So I was going around, I was going um, across to a uh, chair and I go, Jared, would you get involved in this little game here? Yeah. So how, I, how that happened and it's continued now. So one of the first parents engaged in that was a man called Colin McGurr. Um, Colin's a true man, but obviously I adopted him from Anna now and married to a listen ski lady. Or, um, so, but one of the things that I had with, with Colin was that I didn't want him moving up through the age groups. I wanted him staying with the under sixes. That was very difficult. Um, but getting him sticking to that web was class. And again, it was a matter of just engaging with the parents, chatting with them. And when they saw that, they could see that, you know, it's fun, the children enjoy it, the numbers are great, they're staying, they're learning something new, they're engaged in the club and the parents are getting involved in the club as well. Yeah. In in Rockland was a little bit different. Um, because of the culture out there in terms of competitive sport and the context within New York. So for example, there's go games, but it's only at the CYC, which is basically um the Continental Youth Championships in the summer. But during the whole rest of the year, under tens play 15 aside, they'll they'd be playing the advanced mark now if we were not in restrictions. So what we had to do within Rockland was we would do um, mini games and internal bits, similar to what a lot of clubs do. 
but I would have specific coaching workshops with our coaches, but also engagement workshops with our parents. Under six, under eights, under tens were separate. Twelves and fourteens were together. Sixteens uh, and eighteens were together, and then over eighteen as well. Some of the senior teams, but the parents had to come to it. Children didn't come. So we would set them out of a plan of what was happening, you know, what evenings we were going, and we would have went two evenings. So we would have went, sorry, Tuesday and Thursday um, after the Saturday sessions were finished. But we always went twice. Now, we didn't do that to overload the children. We did it for the parents. Some of them could come in one evening, some of them couldn't come yeah. in another evening. But then I'm putting extra pressure on the coaches. But once they understood that and they got involved in the sessions and some of the parents were mad keen to get involved and we used them. So what I would say to clubs and in terms of coaches and clubs in terms of engaging with parents is ask them. Ask, yeah. You don't ask, yeah. you don't get. The worst yeah. they can do is I, say no. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Ron. If, if you don't ask, don't you ask know, the, yeah, yeah. And, and look, that's a policy that's worked really, really well in, in, in my club here in Berra. Uh, ask and the amount of people that we have gotten engaged just by and, and, and even as you say ask them to stay at a, a session you know and just watch, watch for, for, for initially and then but just uh, on, on that just one thing you mentioned there was uh, um, and I know we're moving about a bit but it was just something that you said there about staying with the age groups uh, what's your thoughts on that you know um, it's kind of a, a controversial enough subject in, in some clubs because Daddy or Mummy want to follow uh, we Jimmy or Johnny, but it's something that we have tried to um, maybe roll back from. Uh, what's your thoughts on it? That swings around a bit. It depends on the context. Um, what I would do and what I would stress is, like for example, the under sixes, the foundation age is extremely important. And again, getting to know the parents, getting to know the children. If you're only there for a year or two, and you're continuing moving up, you're just continuing, you're continuing that coaching, um, coaching pathway, which is great. Yeah. But you have to have consistency in that as well. So what we would have done with Rockland, now, easy to do in Rockland because I was always with under six. It was easy to do with me with Listen Ski because I was always going to be on the, involved in under six and the eights in terms of parents. Yeah. My job was easier for me to do that um, because, yes, I was volunteering, but I was doing that in other clubs um, in in America, and I, I know obviously in terms of your 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 own club, you're in a lot of clubs in America. Everybody followed, so parents because they want to coach their child, which has obviously can have different variations in that. And yeah. Agreement, but nine times out of ten, parents want to move with their children the whole way up through the age groups. That's great, but just being aware that you keep that consistency, especially at under six and under eight. Uh, there's yeah. a consistent presence. Now, they don't have to be coaching. They could be a floater or, you know, they could be the one who are just facilitating and helping the coach. Yeah. We... So whether it's the coaching officer in the club, if they're comfortable to do that, if you're lucky to have somebody working, it's their job, and then they're coming as a volunteer and do it, you're extremely lucky as well. But it's very difficult to have a volunteer stay with the whole aid group. And yeah. Well, funny, we, we, we would have done a, a lot of work to try and ensure because we felt that building that specialism at, yeah. you know, under six mm -hmm. or under eight was, was, was critical. And we talked to the, the, the coaches that came in maybe six, five, six, seven years ago to, to it has worked well. But um, moving on from that there, um, what, what I'm thinking about small rural clubs, you know, particularly in 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 Fana with 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 small numbers. Oh, and what do you say about combining age groups, tens and twelves? You know, because the numbers. What what's your views or thoughts on that? Again, depending on the numbers, I have no issue with that whatsoever. However, it depends on how you're going to structure those sessions. So, like, a lot of the session should be separate. Um, however, depending on the numbers, you might have to mix them a bit. They mix them in terms of their own age, which is great. But challenge the older players. So, like, we would have done with under six and under eights. Some of the under eights are coming to the under six session because their brother and sister are 
and the parent has to, have to come. So they're at that session. So I would use those as little helpers. But again, it depends on their behavior and you know what connection you have with those and what responsibility you give them. In terms of during the session, because of bringing the age groups together and the smaller clubs, the numbers are smaller, obviously, in terms of age groups, but they're also smaller, probably in terms of coaching numbers too. Yeah. So rather than have an uh, under eight coach who is probably could be involved in under six and under eights, separate evenings. So bringing those two together is going to help with that volunteer. It's going to cut their time in half in terms of the amount of time that they're coaching. Hopefully they're going to enjoy it a lot more because they can put more um, care into their sessions. Not that they wouldn't care about their sessions anyway, but they have less sessions. They can um, tailor the sessions a lot better in terms of the age group that they're working with. They're going to challenge themselves as well. But having the players together, the biggest issue is safety. Um, yeah. Making yeah. sure it's safe in terms of the space that you have in terms of the team matchups, player matchups, um, and but I would have no issue with having an older an older player, a player who is you know one of the perceived better players in the younger age group, and then a player who kind of needs a little bit more assistance. Put those three players together, but get them to help each other out. You know you yeah. want to create that dynamic that it's a team. We help each other. We are supporting each other. You know so that when the coach creates that, you'll get those many coaches on the field. Yeah. And maybe maybe this here isn't in the coaching manual, but you know the way at the end of a coaching session, uh, players love to get a wee game. But if you have eights, tens and twelves or something like that together, is there there's safety issues there? Is that there is, yeah, but like a game, a game, a game I have a kind of game as me playing against you one V one. Um three V three. It doesn't have to be a big game. Um, so if you have six eights and tens together, or eights, tens and twelves together, split the field into three, and rotate, have three different uh, games, yeah. get the games around like that, so that, yeah. but the coaches stay at those games. So yeah. for example, the, and this is this is where the coaches are going to learn about the players because the coach at the bottom game, the middle and the top are going to learn more by the first group than they are by the last group. Because the first group, the game could have went rubbish. Didn't listen. Okay, well, I'm going to change this game a little bit for the next team coming. Yeah. But if that team is an older team, they're going to have to change the game anyway. So they might give them um, a condition. They might um, constrain the pitch. So obviously in terms of a constraints led approach. So putting a time limit on them, making the pitch smaller or making it bigger for a younger age group to give them yeah. more obviously success. Um, but a game is scoring. If there's a point to the game, so the the new um, introduction to Gaelic games coach education course that's um, in the process of being finished talks about game, and the game has to have a goal, but it has to have a learning objective. Right? A has to be there has to be activity, lots of activity, lots of movement. The M motivation, making decisions. The E has to be enjoyable. But the S has to be a score, whether that's into the goal, whether that's me passing to you, and that's a point because you caught it, because that's yeah. the session. So if it's the game, it doesn't have to be a game at the end. And I per se, yeah, yeah. But if they're asking you, if they're asking you, oh, can we play a game? Then you need to think about what you're doing during your session. Yeah. And tell me, just, and I know we're, we're getting bogged down on this one a wee bit, but boys and girls together, yeah. no issues with that. Again, it comes down to safety. Um, in New York, it's um, and obviously depend on where the clubs and girls playing obviously um, at six, eights, tens, and then obviously twelves as well. In New York, it was completely different. So an under an under fourteen girl can play down an age group. All right. So that was again that was for participation basis, but yeah. obviously there's a different context and it can be taken advantage of. But I have yeah. no issue, no issue with girls playing with boys, and vice versa because everybody's learning. As long as, as long as it's tailored to their needs, as long as they're learning, as long as they're enjoying it. But the safety is the biggest aspect. So you know the different matchups that you're going to have, what you're doing, um, but like the different skills. So like the boys can be learned about ladies' football and come away and the differences in some of the rules. 
and vice versa as well. And that was one of the most kind of enjoyable aspects of being in America because you've gone through the intricacies of the different rules and why this rule is rule for this and yeah. the different advantages and disadvantages it has. But I would have no issue okay. with it at all. It's a safety, right. it's not as learning and engagement. I have no issue with it at all. Yeah, no, good stuff. No, and a couple of things then, uh, just to run through a few things that I picked up from your your presentation there, Owen. You, you, you kept reinforcing one team per session, one thing at a time. Uh, and like maybe before that, are you talking about just one one skill or one outcome? What, what do you mean exactly by that? Yeah. So if we go to with the one skill, so let's let's take uh, let's take fist pass and hand pass. Now, if you're doing if you're in your head, if you're working with another sex group and your theme is hand passing, then you need your head check. <laughs> it's not going to work unless unless the children are doing it at home anyway. Um, but that one theme will impact everything that you do. So if it's hand passing, I don't care what game you do as long as you're using your hands and passing it. Don't care. That there will create um, different skill levels and competency levels. Some of them, if I was doing it and I'm using my hands to pass it and I can hand pass it, but I might still throw it. But I'm still using my hands. I'm still having that um, manipulation and object control in terms of fundamental movement skills. But if I want to go specifically, if the group are ready, under 12s, under 10s, even under 8s, and go straight for a hand pass, that's not matter. Right? But can they put it into a game under pressure or when they're moving? And then let's give that for their homework then, for the next session. You know, practice both sides, both hands. Both so, sides. so the theme, the theme of, of that session would have been hand passing. Yeah, but again, you're if you keep if you have that one theme in your head, then you're not worried about if they're kicking. You're not worried about if they're picking the ball off the ground. Your focus is hand passing or catching or um, being able to kick the ball. Doesn't matter. That that is the focus of your session because when you say that to the children, children, we're going to look at catching first. Right. Now, catching could be high catch, body catch, low catch. But there's three different scenarios that you have for that one session. Yeah. Right? yeah. Asking them what they can do. Right? Show me how you can catch, all the different ways you can catch. You're getting an idea then of what they can do, and then you can make it easier or harder related to catching. Yeah, and one of the things you, you kept talking about, or not kept talking about, but you did uh, reinforce through your presentation was about questioning and telling. Um, I, I suppose it's something that resonated with me. Is there an age limit where you where you start questioning as opposed to telling? Because I can I can't imagine questioning three or four year olds, uh, you know, or five year olds to give input to to a session. But maybe there's where I'm wrong. I am wrong. That that there's probably the biggest, the biggest enjoyment you're going to get because some of the answer, some of the answers you're going to get are not <laughs> going to be related to your session. Uh, yeah. But in terms of the question in here, like if you have a group of uh, like four, three and four and five year olds, asking them, what can you do with the ball? And they have a ball, and they're like normally they'll do whatever's comfortable for them. But then you say, okay, well, can you, can you show me all the different ways you can use that ball? Now, uh, Teresa has done it, and I can guarantee you, everybody who worked with the Ulster GA has done it in schools. You ask a child what to do with the ball, you might you'll get other people who are throwing and catching, kicking, dribbling, whatever it is. You'll have some who are sitting on the ball. They're still using the ball. <laughs> you'll have yeah. some crawling along the ground, moving it with their knees. It's still different. But you're getting that creativity element, um, and you're questioning them in terms of what they can do, not the cognitive ability of what they understand. Mm. So a little bit different. That questioning is about what they're doing or are they enjoying it? And in yeah. fairness, they'll have a long time if they're not enjoying it. But that yeah. that could that is just a question. Um, um, and when do you see the, the coaching of skills coming in? I know it under sexes it's about engagement and as you say, fun and and whatever, but uh, at under eights, is that still too young to be um, working on, on on skills of the game? Under under fours, I would still do the skills of the game. So the, the, right. in terms of gross motor skills, the biggest one is picking it up, moving somewhere else, putting it down. That's the first yeah. stage of the pickup. So um, 
but that's where the purposeful play comes in, as I talked to you later on or earlier on. So when I say the child led and then collaborative, the coach with the child. But then the last one is the coach with, or sorry, the child, with, child and the coach together. But the last one is purposeful and it's the child or the coach with the child. So the coach is being, is being more challenging for the child in terms of what they want them to do. And that's where, okay, right, we're going to do the hand pass today. And if it works, great. If not, I want to challenge you. Well, just see what you can do. See how it goes. But you're still doing the games mm -hmm. and doing the skills for your own session. However, yeah. one of the things that you do want to be careful of is not too games based and not too skill drills. I hate the word drills. It drives me bananas. Yeah. So if you want to drill, go to B and Q. That's where the language comes in. So activities, you know, the pragmatic language activities and games. But yeah. having it that do you have an idea of what you want to do? And then it's how you marry that together. Now, depending on the behavior of the children, there is going to be times where you're going to have to go, listen, this game is not working. Absolutely, off the walls today, we're going to go into hand passing and moving. No, no attacking, no defending, because you want to get the skill related, but then you're, you're telling them, listen, mate, you weren't doing what we asked you. It goes back to respect, it goes back to listening, it goes back to being engaged. So we're going to do this now. Right, but we won't, when we go back into the game, I want to see your hand pass. Right, you'll get an extra point for a hand pass. Right? Then they'll focus yeah. more on the skill if it's overemphasized in the game. But use, and that's where the parents come in as well. So yeah, them, yeah. here's the, here's their homework, whatever way you want to call yeah. it. Yeah, here's no. Because you you no, have them for two uh, two and a half hours here. You can't. Yeah, you know, but, yeah. Session, so it's. Yeah. Being at home and practicing their skills like they're doing now is huge, and hopefully that's going to continue. Whatever restrictions are. And just a couple of quick things, as I'm conscious of the times, times moving on. Uh, just to wrap it up, just a quick, a couple of short answers if you can, Owen. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your thoughts on uh, ability versus age? You know, should coaches keep kids in their own age group, no matter what uh, their ability is? Yes, no. Uh, uh, again, that it depends, and there's actually research now that leads back it. It depends is an answer. It depends on context. It depends on the ability of the children. It depends on uh, the age group of the children. And again, that's a very difficult one. And I'm not. If you had a good, if you had a good under under eight, and you knew he was capable of playing under tens, would you let him go to the under tens, or would you keep him with under eights? If it's to do, if there's enough numbers at under ten, he stays at under eight. Yeah. With yeah. with, with Rockland in New York, we, we yeah. could do. That. We had enough. So yeah, we had a, and it was easier for us to do. It. But again, yeah. in terms of numbers, if it's a case of they have to move up, but not being specialising that young child to move up to under tens, why don't you yeah. just do a rotation? Everybody's going to get a chance to move up, so that you know yeah. you don't specialise too early and that everybody gets a chance. Yeah, and um, just uh, you mentioned that this the, the, the lockdown time or we're coming out of lockdown, but lockdown. I mean. What things can parents and coaches be doing uh, during this this time to, to help their child's development? A couple of quick tips on that one. Twitter is a minefield. Oh, it's phenomenal. Um, you know what? Sure being, being, uh, being obviously working with Dublin now, uh, the hashtag Dublin uh, DubGA Skills. There's loads yeah. of videos and skills videos that we were doing. I know obviously Teresa um, and Hannah and Devlin, the girls would have been using Kieran Kilkenny's skill challenges yeah. and prizes, using as many different resources as you can um, and just keeping things fresh for the children and for yourself, whether you're a coach or a parent, you know, using the backyard if you can and getting them to come up with their own sessions. If it's a rainy day, okay, right, come up with your own sessions so that when we do go back outside, you're coming up with the games, you're coming up with the activities, you know, so just uh, just keep it fresh, enjoy, enjoy the Enjoy the fact of the children can kind of come up with it themselves. Yeah. Again, that's where the collaborative nature comes in. Brilliant, brilliant. Great stuff. Oh, look, at, I'm conscious we've crept up uh, over, over, over the hour mark. Uh, our producers will be uh, uh, sending us text messages or whatever to tell us to, to, cl to close it down. Uh, but we could, we could chat all day. It's been, it's been a real pleasure having you on board. I hope you enjoyed it. 
definitely did, Joe. Thank you very much for the invite and the Theresa and Phil as well in the background for facilitating this also. Good man. Yeah, and look, we hope to see you up in Fermanagh on many occasions in the in the weeks and months and years ahead. Um, always, always good to have you back up in your, your home county. Definitely, definitely. Okay, folks, well, uh, thanks very much to Owen for his great presentation and his insightful comments there. Plenty of questions to throw one at him. And I hope you all take something from this uh, webinar session here, here tonight. Um, again, uh, this is the second um, session. We're going to have another one next week. Uh, if you watch on social media, you'll uh, see who our guests are. We have a number of uh, um, people in the pipeline. And we hope to get that firmed up in the, in the coming days. And um, from Anna GA TV, as you know, have their main broadcast schedule ongoing between quizzes and coaching webinars and championship finals and league finals and so on and so forth. There's there's something there, I think, for every GA enthusiast in Fermanagh and, and further afield. And for that, I suppose a big thank you goes to uh, Phil Flanagan for all his work uh, in promoting uh, from Anna GA TV uh, during the month of May um, for putting out uh, a range of broadcasts to, to suit everybody. So as Owen says, big thank you to Teresa McNabb and to Phil for their work and then getting this broadcast together. And once again, a big thank you to our special guest tonight, Owen Mooney, former listener Ski Emmett, now Dublin GA coach. Owen, thanks again for joining us and we look forward to chatting in the near future. But from now, from all of Fermanagh GA TV, we wish you well and we thank you for joining us. And until we meet again, Sloan. Take care, guys. Stay safe.